Oh, I listened to Chuck yesterday, you know. I watched Pastor Chuck and Pastor Damien from a pastor's conference in 2005. I will share them later at some point when I get the time to burn them over. Well, let's stand and worship the Lord. What a beautiful day, huh? Nice, cool mornings. It hasn't gotten super hot. I know, I know. We live in California. What can I expect? Ah, Lord, we love you. You are so good. Lord, we are your children. You are our Father. And we thank you for your tremendous love for us. And we pray, Father, that you would just bless us, strengthen us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit afresh and anew. Lord, we need to be broken so that you can pour out your grace and your spirit upon our lives. And so, Lord, As we were praying during the men's prayer meeting, I have this image of a bucket of grace just flowing over us, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for it. Thank you that that bucket never comes to an end. You are so amazingly good. Thank you for this night. We pray that you'd bless it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You will. 
was the last one, right? <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Evening. Have a seat. Hosea. That's Hosea. All right. Title of tonight's message is No Knowledge of God. No Knowledge of God. Father, Lord, it breaks my heart to see so much of this no knowledge of God, not only in our world, which I guess to a certain extent for thousands and thousands of years, that's always been the case. But sadly, Lord, as we will read tonight, even amidst people who name your name. So Lord, help us to just be that continued salt and light. Help us, Lord, to share your truth and love. Even though that truth may not be appreciated, it may be persecuted at some time. But Lord, help us to just keep the right perspective, the right heart, Lord, that God so loved, you so loved the world. That's the message of hope, Lord. And may that come from our hearts and from our lips, Lord. Amen. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. And we all said, Amen. Hosea 4. We're going to try to get through 4 and 5. You know, I think God's timing is always a unique thing. I think you guys can agree with me on that, right? You know, I was studying this message here. I've been in Hosea 4 and 5 now for several weeks because I just can't seem to get out of it. I enjoy it. And then all of a sudden, I, I go to, this afternoon, I go to put the live link on YouTube, and this big box come up. I've been a bad boy. <laughs> and we got a strike. Now, I have received several warnings I've received several warnings over messages that we did in Revelations like two years ago. And I've, over the last few months, I've been getting warnings. But today, they came out and said, strike one. I'm, I'm assuming you get three strikes, and then you're just completely banned forever. So let's see if I can do that. 
Um, I don't know what I said or what I did. When I went to go investigate, when I started to go down this road, you could investigate it. I just said, this is going to take me out of the text tonight, and I don't want to do that. And now I couldn't figure out what I did. I can't figure out where that notification went. I'll try to figure it out later. But why is that so, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me it's just, a, it, it's not a coincidence. Because what we're going to talk about today is just going to overlap. By the way, as I was studying this portion of Scripture, I just want to give you a heads up. This morning, I was like, this has got to come on Sunday morning. And so we actually may bring the same message on Sunday morning. So you're going to get the first draft, and then Sunday morning I'll have it polished. <laughs> but I don't know yet. I'm not 100% there. I'm going to pray about it tonight, pray about it tomorrow. But I may bring, just a heads up, I may bring this same message on Sunday because it's a message that is so needed in our time. The reason why we started these minor prophets to encourage the all-stars out here, to encourage our church seriously. We're a remnant. We really are in these last of the last days. And I think you guys know that already. I know I've preached a lot about it over the years, but I'm going to go through it very methodically tonight. This is what we're doing here is unique. And sadly, there's a lot of churches, and, I, and there's a lot of great churches out there in the world. Please do not get me wrong. A lot of wonderful churches out in the world so when I say this, I don't want to sound overly negative. I want to be very careful not to sound negative. Hey, how are you? It is good to see you. Come on in. Anywhere, sit anywhere. This is welcome. Did you just move in? Yes. You just got here. Well, a couple of days ago. Awesome. So. Old friend of ours. Oh, cool. For like 20 years or so. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. You'll get to meet everybody. You'll fit right in, I guarantee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You won't, get, you won't get it lost again. <laughs> All right. So where was I? Oh, lost my thought. Lord, give it back to me. I'm getting old. Yeah, Jose on Sunday. Yeah, but okay. No, no, no. Remnant. Okay, we're a remnant because, I mean, listen, a lot, of, a lot of precious brothers and sisters out there, but the church has really lost focus. And so the reason why I just sense the Lord calling us to go to the minor prophets is to encourage the remnant, to encourage the special forces um, and so I just, that's the purpose for being here because there's so many parallels between what we're reading today in Hosea and what's taking place today that it's absolutely startling, if you will. As you guys know, the minor prophets, major prophets, the minors are the ones who just couldn't make the majors, man. They just didn't have what it took. They got to AAA, like the Dodgers just called up this young guy called Gavin Stone, and he got rocked for six runs the other day in Tampa Bay, and they sent him immediately back. No, that's not what this is about. The Minor Prophets are the last 12 Old Testament books, and they are packed. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The reason for the difference is not substance, it's actually length. The Minor Prophets are generally shorter, with the exception of Hosea and Zechariah which both have 14 chapters. Daniel only has 12, so they're longer than Daniel. So why these scholars divided them up in these ways, I really don't know. Their scope does seem to be more narrow, where the major prophet seems to be more broad. Maybe that's the definition as to why they really, um, you know, in the subject matter, the, the major prophets seem to be broad, where the minor prophets seem to be more narrow. Who knows? We know Hosea's name actually means Jesus, really. Joshua in the Hebrew, Jesus in the Greek. We know that he ministered between 752 B.C. and 722 B.C. Hosea ministered at a time when the kingdoms were split. We know they had the northern kingdom in the top. They had the southern kingdom in the bottom. The northern kingdom is where he ministered. The southern kingdom um, is where Isaiah ministered at the exact same time. The king that he, he actually ministered, uh, 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 Hosea did, was Jeroboam number 2. And actually, uh, the southern kingdom was ruled by Uzziah, Jothan, as Ahaz, Hezekiah were the kings of Judah at that time. Contemporaries, I got those charts. You guys, I, I put them, I finally got those rows. Could you, do you get some? Yeah, right there. She has one. They're on the back table there. That, I, I don't know, it helps me. You know, you read the text and you're trying to figure out when Hosea and Isaiah were around. Well, that actually lays it out, the years that they were around, on top of who was the king in the north and who was the king in the south. And so for me, it really just helps get a nice visual and help, it helps bring the package full circle for me. Now, we know that Hosea's ministry to the northern kingdom, also known as Ephraim, um, because of its largest tribe, 
took place during a time of prosperity. The Assyrians had pulled back, and Jeroboam too was ruling and reigning, and everything was, the, the taxes were low, and everything was going seemingly pretty good. But that prosperity led to complacency, as it is in our nation today. It is leading to oh, just total decay in our country. And I want you guys, I know we haven't even read Hosea yet, but would you flip over to Second Chronicles real quick? I just want you to see this because this is the condition of the northern kingdom. This is the condition. This is what was taking place in the northern kingdom. And in essence, all the Levite priests in the northern kingdom, bamboosed. They picked up, they left because they weren't welcomed. And they raised up kings, Jeroboam first raised up kings, priests, I mean priests, to do the serving of the Lord. Look at verse, uh, chapter 11, 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 13. And from all their territories and priests and the Levites who were in all Israel took their stand with him. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. Then he appointed himself for himself priests for the high place, for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. And after the Levites left, those from whom all the tribes of Israel, Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong for three years because they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. Guys, you can flip back to Hosea now, but do you not see the same thing taking place? We're a remnant. They left the northern kingdom because Jeroboam didn't want them. He wanted to raise up priests for himself. We know that this from the Old Testament, that this is totally wrong because they had to come from the tribe of Levi. They had to come from the lineage of Aaron. And so what he was doing was completely rejecting God's authority and putting his own authority in place. And so everyone was searching now, right now, what we have is everyone leaving California to go to Florida or Tennessee or Texas or wherever, you know, because they're, they're just trying to flee from the evil in which we're in. And, and in some ways, I understand that. But in other ways, I think that God's given us a different time frame in which to minister here. And I think we need to minister behind enemy lines, if you will. So I'm not going anywhere until the Lord says otherwise. And even if he does, I'm going to argue with him if you want to know the truth. What? You want me to go where? No, I want to stay right here and stay in the trenches. And so this is the condition of Israel. They've raised up their own priest, and now the Assyrians come in, and they decide they want to revisit taking over. They actually enslave Israel for a while. There's a revolt. Israel is then hauled away captive. Now that's the northern kingdom. Ephraim and Israel is what it's called. The bottom kingdom is Judah. And Judah was temporarily spared at this time frame because we know from 2 Chronicles 32, that Shennacherib, the general for the Assyrians, was going to come down and take Judah too in the south. But God preserved them because of the prayers of Isaiah and Hezekiah. So there was a revival there that was taking place. The theme of this great book is really God's amazing grace and love. Israel is going to be judged, but what we see throughout the process of this whole book is God so loved Israel, God so loves the world. And he so loves Israel to this day. Chapters 1 through 3, just a brief update. Remember, Hosea was a prophet. He was a man who was willing to stand in the gap. He was a man who loved God more than the approval of men. And I got to tell you this. He was faithful to the message God gave him to give. He wasn't afraid to be banned from YouTube. <laughs> he was just going to give the message, whether it brought a ban or didn't bring a ban. Now listen, listen. We laugh at that, but I'm going to tell you, what we're going to see here in chapters 4 and 5 is the priests were afraid they were going to be banned from YouTube. The people didn't want to hear the message anymore, so they catered the message to the people, which left no knowledge of God for the people, which ultimately resulted in no mercy for God for the people and no love for the Lord for the people, and the people just started doing what we see taking place today. You know, it's interesting on that YouTube, and I'm not going to go too much further on it, but let me just say this. It's funny that I got a ban, and the Dodgers are hosting this, these, these nuns who are transgender. And I mentioned it before we started. I don't want to go into too much detail. But these guys, I watched 10 seconds of a video that somebody put. And what they're doing is the most heinous and disgusting thing. It's vile. Yet those videos don't get banned. 
This is, this is the country we live. Now listen, I'm not mad at the world, okay? So please don't misunderstand any of this. I'm disgusted and disturbed, right, as anybody would be watching this stuff, right? The world is a mess, and God's saying, come, let us reason that your sins are like scarlet, that they may, you may come to me and they may be as white as snow. For God so loved the world. Great, got it. I can be disgusted, I can be disturbed, I can be upset, but the world needs Jesus. What we're going to focus in on in these chapters is not the world, is that the church is failing the world by not standing strong on the promises of God because they might get banned from YouTube or they might preach to a half-empty sanctuary on a Wednesday night. And so, anyways, he was a man, Hosea was also a man who did not have a concern for his personal comfort. And that's important. If we want to be used by God, we have to be a, a man who is willing to stand in the gap. Ezekiel, I, I look for a man to stand in the gap. Will we be that man, that woman that will stand in the gap for the Lord wherever he has called us to stand in that gap for? Hey, will we... Will we love God more than we love the, uh, the uh, praise and uh, 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 you know, uh, approval of man? We need to have God's approval more than the love of man. And stay faithful to the message. And will we be people who will allow him to make us uncomfortable personally? Now, I've been uncomfortable personally ever since 1995 when I committed this. My, I committed my life, obviously, you guys know, in 86 but to be a believer. But when I just sold out and just put my life on the altar, Romans 12.1, in 95, it's been a very uncomfortable life in regards to just certain things, but it's actually been the best life ever. I would not trade it for anything, not one thing. Why was he uncomfortable? Because you guys know this, he was told to marry a prostitute. The prostitute, this is similitudes that God is using. Hosea is represented by, God is represented by Hosea. He marries Gomer, a harlot, and harlot is represented by Israel. And what God is basically saying is, I am God, and you people of Israel are Gomer, and you guys are playing the harlot when you go to your false gods. You go to your false gods, you do those things, you are being the harlot. And it's just, I know I hit that hard last week, but it's a good thing to remember. When we sin, we're actually playing the harlot in, in regards to just, it, you know, I mean, I know we're all saved and there's grace, don't get me wrong, but I just, when I think like that, it just helps me get a little bit more handle on the sin that kind of, you know, it, I don't let it run wild in my mind when I think about, man, if I do that, I'm going to play in the harlot. Does that make sense? The name of his kids, Jezreel, means to scatter, which would later take place under the Assyrian army, but it was also retribution to what Jehu did. Remember in 2 Kings chapter 10, when he came in and he massacred all the uh, descendants of Ahab, and he set up a new kingly lineage. And every single one of those kings, I think for like the next king, king six, six kings, it was just devastation after devastation, assassination, stuff like this. Those kings did not last well. And so basically, the northern kingdom was being scattered by God. He was pronouncing judgment. And then his other, his other daughter was Lurama, and her name meant no mercy. And then his last son was Lo Amy, and that meant not my people. And God's going to redeem these names, as you guys know. He's going to redeem these names. But basically, God's saying... <laughs> I'm going to scatter you, I'm not going to have mercy on you, and you're no longer my people. I'm divorcing you. And then we know towards the end of chapter 3, he tells Hosea, bring her back. <laughs> After all the stuff she's done to me and you, bring her back. And that's God. That's God's grace, right? That just pours out in bucketfuls in our life. All right. Hosea 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. I just stopped on that this morning, and I meditated on it for like 30 minutes. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. It's as if God is pleading with his people, would you please hear my word? The words that bring life, the words that bring hope, the words that bring grace, the words that are loving, the words that say, hey, you got a problem, but I got the solution. Will you please hear these words? And I could just hear him pleading with mankind, hear these words, hear these words. Because God is pleading with the world to hear his words. But people don't want to hear. It's hard for them to hear. Because if they hear that they are sinners, then there's, it's just like they don't, they can't, they can't grapple with it. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. 
but you are now listening to people who think that they're perfectly okay living in their debauchery and not hearing the word of God. People love religion and people love being a part of a church. And sadly, this has even affected the church because people in the church, we understand the world not wanting to hear it, but in the church, people are still not wanting to hear it. And the church has been dumbed down. People love being a part of religion, love being a part of a church, the benefit that comes with being with God's people. But when it gets down to a relationship, when it gets down to the brass tacks that they're actually sinners and they actually need to make a change and a real commitment has to come from them, that's where the trouble lies. Now, real Christians like you and I, we struggle with that submission to him every day, don't we? I mean, on a consistent basis. But we continually get up and say, Lord, you know, help us with our struggles. We're sorry. Forgive us. That's the difference between a real Christian and somebody who is just playing to be a Christian. And I'm telling you, the church is loaded. We go from this passage, we can go to Ezekiel, we go to Timothy, we can go through Acts 20, which we're going to go to some of these passages. Look, there is clear indication from 2 Timothy 3, 5, people have a form of godliness but deny its power, and from such, people turn away. And so when, I, when, I, when we realize this, that yes, we understand the world doesn't want to come, but sadly, even the church is now not wanting to come to hear the full counsel of God's word. Just give me a sermonette for Christianette, send me on my way, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there. Help me be a better father. Help me with my finances. Help me with these things. And will the church hear the word of God? We're coming into some dark, we're in dark days. I mean, I got to stop saying we're coming. We're in dark days. I think they're going to get darker. And the, 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 the pulpits have failed to warn and everyone, oh man, it's just, it's just sad to me. We got to warn the church, pay attention, wake up. It's high time, it's past time to understand the times and seasons in which we live. So the Lord is pleading not only with the world, but he, pleading, I believe, in a good portion of his church today to hear his words. You children of Israel, you children of the Lord that are out there hearing this message later on. For the Lord brings a charge against you, the inhabitants of the land. This is God's indictment. This is never a good thing. This is never a good thing. Okay? I have a charge against you. I have a charge against you. Now, you flip forward to Revelation 7, and you look at those letters to the seven churches, and Jesus says to every church except for maybe two, Right? Smyrna. Smyrna was the persecuted one? Or Pergamos? I can't remember which one. Smyrna. And Philadelphia. But the rest, what did Jesus say? Ephesus. You're doing all these great things, but I have this against you. A charge. And what does he say at the end of most of those letters, if not all of them? I can't remember. He who has an ear, let, this, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And it is so important that we allow the Lord to filter through our life and to make sure, Lord, you have a charge against me. Jeff, man, you did this and you're doing this and this is awesome, but Jeff, I have this. Lord, when I know when you're saying that, you're saying it with tenderness and you're saying it with love and you're saying it with grace and I want to have an ear to hear what you want to say to me, amen? And I want to be a broken vessel so that you can pour out your grace into my heart so that that grace can then flow out and to others. But these guys had a charge against them. I would not want to be listening to that type of charge that God has against Israel at this point because he knows they're not going to repent. You and I have the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he goes on in verse 1. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. People have rejected truth. Truth, truth is lost in this culture. It's relevant. You have your truth, I have my truth. We've talked about that many times. When you take these three and you lose truth and everything becomes relevant, then God's mercy starts to erode. So we've been, there's no truth for decades. And now we're experiencing a removal of his hand and no mercy. And why? Because the knowledge and fear of God is lost. You see the parallels between America, <laughs> circa 2023, Israel back then, 
722, 25, somewhere in there. It has not changed. It has not changed. The knowledge of God is lost. God is judging America. God is judging is, 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 has judged Israel. The knowledge of God is lost. Now, this word knowledge in the Hebrew can, is closely connected to the Greek word gnosko. And you know that gnosko means there's an intimate knowledge of. It's used in the relationship between a man and a wife. There's a gnosko. There's a knowledge of. It's used in that way. And so God is saying, there is no intimacy with me at all with people. They don't, they don't even know me. They don't even, they're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're gone. They're just, they're gone. And when a culture loses the fear of God, then it starts to go downhill real fast. And Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We have lost the fear of God. We have lost the truth. We have lost the mercy because we have no knowledge of God. And in just a minute, we're going to read his people perish because of lack of knowledge. May we just continue to grow in that knowledge and be encouraged through studying these texts like this. Who says the Old Testament isn't relevant for today? Verse 2, by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. By swearing, lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Meaning there's no boundaries. There's nothing left. They don't retain themselves. They don't, they don't restrain themselves in any way. Whatever pleasure we want, we go for it, right? No boundaries, no rules, just my rights. Just do what it feels good. Living without any concern about anything about tomorrow. And that's what verse 2 is talking about, circa 2023 in America. You see all kinds of perversion flash before your screen that doesn't get banned, but the truth gets banned. Whoa, we're living the pages of Hosea. And Israel was just doing this right in front of God, playing the harlot. Verse 3, therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away from the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. This is tragic fruit of forsaking the knowledge of God, truth, mercy, and resistance, is that they just everything just gets to be taken away. He gives them over. He just he eventually gives them over to their debauchery. And things will be taken away. Israel had the, the promise that if they went in there and obeyed, they would be blessed. He's giving them over. They'll waste away. You know, Romans 1, verses 18 through 32 talks about how they suppressed the truth of God. They didn't want to listen to God. And what did God do? He gave them over to a debased mind. And we see the progress through it. And that's where we're at today. What concerns me, I, don't get me wrong, I'm concerned for the world, obviously. I want every person that I know and, and, and love, and even those I don't know personally, to come to know that Jesus Christ is Savior, right? Amen? Amen. But what is, in, a, in the context of where we're at today and tonight in our text, is, is, is the end of chapter 1 of Romans. When it says in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of, deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. And listen, this has concerned me a long time in the church. What do you want to call it? Wokeness, liberalism, progressivism, whatever the name you want to call it. There are people who are connected to the church who have so much worldly idea that they have no problem supporting all this vile stuff that this takes place in Romans 1 and that is taking place in our culture today. And God says, you may not be involved in these things personally, physically doing them, but if you are actually supporting them, you're actually participating in it. Pastor Chuck, when he was teaching this, he goes, well, maybe that means all those movies everyone's watching. <laughs> okay, Chuck, that's a pretty tough thing to say. But, but he was right. 
I mean, how do you, he started talking about, you're watching all these movies that are boom, 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 shoot them up, shoot them up, you know? Why are we watching it? Are we approving it? Not to be legalistic, I'm not going there, but I'll tell you what, just be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear. Verse 4, now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. The priest should have been the spiritual authority for the people, Deuteronomy 17, 9, 9 through 20. God gave them clear authority to be the, the, the clear authority to be the priest, to lead the people, but the people were casting them off. They didn't want to hear what the priests were having to say. And so here God's basically saying, don't waste your time. It's coming to an end. You know, sadly, we still have an opportunity to reach this lost world. But these, these, this is what God's saying, you know, just don't contend with them. You know, just move on. Same today. The people don't want to hear the truth of God's word. Sadly, not just in the world, but in the church. I've said this over and over again. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desire... Because they have itching ears, they have heaped up for themselves teachers in that day. And I know I've hammered this point home over the last eight so years I've been here, but because it, it's because of texts like this, and it's because of texts like Timothy, and it's because of things that I consistently hear on a consistent basis that it troubles my soul because the world is an absolute disaster People come running to the church to get good news, and what they get is not the Bible. It's not. I listened to a message the other day. I listened. I suffered through it twice. I suffered through it twice. The other day, like a year ago, okay? I lose, I lose track of time. I got to be careful when I talk about these things because it sounds like it was yesterday or the day before or whatever. It was a while back. And I just said, okay, I listened to it at first, and the guy was doing a pretty good job. Good communicator, taught for over 42 minutes. And it is possible to actually preach the Word of God, to technically teach it, but to not fully teach it. Does that make sense? You could give the details as to, you know, Hosea was this or Hosea was that, but to miss the point, to miss the application that God wants us to take from it, that was watered down. And I have been in rooms Guys, I've been in rooms. I've seen meetings. I've read articles in which they taught you how to water down the word of God to make it appealing to the flesh. And so this guy must have mentioned hope a thousand times. And you know, one of the things you do is you, you talk about the gospel and it's the good news and it, you know, it saves, it, 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 it's God's rescue plan or, or you know, it's, it, it shows us God's love and all those things are true. But what this guy failed to do was to point out why you needed to be rescued, why God's love was so amazing, and why the gospel was good news. He danced around it for 42 minutes, never once said the word sin until the prayer. And then when he prayed it in the prayer, it was almost like he regretted saying the word sin. You could almost sense that in the tone of his voice. So, what's the motive? I'll tell you, when I was in some of these meetings and watching people do some of the things, it was to keep the seats full. It was to keep the seats full. We need to teach the word of God, whether it empties the building or it fills it up. And, and this is what the church is dealing with today. You, you, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, it's, it's along the subject. I probably should move it to this point anyways. I've been in the meetings there was a guy in Hollywood who became a Christian and he started designing church stages to make them more appealing. And then you walk into these buildings and you come in and you see a stage and it's all dark and the stage is what's lit up and all these blue fancy lights or whatever it is. This was all strategic marketing designed to make people feel a certain way when they walked into your building. And then you have to have this and you have to have that and you have to have this. And all this was designed designed to somehow stimulate our emotions. And I'm just like, <laughs> I sat in one man, I go, why? You know, one of the things John said when he came back here is, you haven't changed anything. Well, why? 
I mean, I don't particularly like the color of the paint. You know, if I were to change anything, I'd change that, but everyone seems to like it, so why change it? Who cares? I don't really care. If you guys want to go meet outside at the park down the street, I'll go meet outside down the park. I mean, I don't care where we meet. And so it's just so important that we understand that the Bible needs to be presented in these congregations, and it's not. It's being watered down. The church is failing the world, and it's failing it at radical proportions. We know that there is an apostate church, and I believe that it is among us. Listen. Zephyr Point Presbyterian Center, the famous Presbyterian Conference Center sitting on the shores of Lake Tahoe, an hour and 10 minutes away from here. Many times I've been up there for retreats. There's a pastor's retreat coming up, conference coming up here in September. Just went on their website because a friend told me what they were doing. They now have a K-I-N slash D-O-M camp. What is that? This Presbyterian Christian camp conference centers has a Ken Dum Dome camp. This is to encourage kids in their sexual sin of LGBTQIA+. Not to help them get out of it, but to continue in it. And this is what is represented in the church today. We're a remnant, aren't we? I have it on the screen. It's impossible to share the truth, even in love, without offending. If we never offend, it would be a positive proof that we did not preach the gospel. Go through the book of John. Jesus was constantly offending everybody. There was divisions. Everywhere he went, the divisions, 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 divisions. Guess what? Everywhere Jesus is at today, divisions, divisions, divisions. Man loves their sin. We as the remnant love Jesus. Division. We try to reach out, but they're not liking us. We still keep reaching out in love. Got it? Division. But now we have another division. Now we have churches that are remnants that are holding fast to the word of God, and then we have churches that are just teaching pablum. The call of a pastor is to preach all the word. I charge you, Timothy is told in 2 Timothy 4, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, meaning that you have to talk about sin. You have to tell them the bad news so they understand the great news. And you have to sometimes actually convince, rebuke, exhort, and you have to do it with long suffering. Why do you have to do it with long suffering? Because it's not easy. It's a whole lot easier not to discipline our kids when we were parents, right? Just give them a lollipop, everything will be fine. But we don't want to raise crooks, and we don't want to raise bad people. So we, what do we do? We take the time to lovingly discipline, to rebuke. Verse 3, 2 Timothy 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own ears, own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Pastors need to contend for the faith, it says in Jude 3. Beloved, there, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which <coughs> was one and all delivered for the saints. We are in the day we need to contend for the faith with the church. I have met pastors who are on the water downside and they take offense to my presence. You can just sense it. You can feel it. I don't, I don't, I'm, I just, I'm just me. Whatever you see of me around here is what you see all the time. But if you've been reading my Facebook post and you're another pastor and you don't want to hang around somebody like me, you think I'm unloving, you think I'm harsh, you think I'm mean. 
but I'm earnestly contending for the faith. And yes, we're to encourage 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, but we are also to warn. This message serves, I know I'm talking to the choir, I know I'm talking to the special forces here, but pastors need to warn like never before. Ezekiel 33, we are watchmen on the wall. We are watchmen on the wall. We see danger, we warn the people. The people don't respond, the blood is on their head. If we see the danger and don't warn the people, the blood is on our heads. This is serious stuff. This is not just, we can just somehow come in here to say, you know, I'm just going to be cute with my words, and I'm not going to mention sin, and I'm going to talk about the good news, and I'm going to talk about the gospel is God's rescue plan or rescue miskin, or, you know, it's, it's his, love, his love letter, and, and you hear all these buzzwords flying around these circles, and, and, and I'm going I'm to preach it because I'm very smart, and I can just kind of, I can smooze it out, but never really tell people that they're sinners and that they really need a Savior. Who are we are called to change and alter the message in any way to water it down? We can't. We do that. We, listen, I'm telling you, what has been hitting me very hard is standing before the beam of seat of Christ. Thank God I'll have eternal life, right? I'll make it because he's just his grace is so good. But my reward, Lord, that I do things with the right motive, that I honor you, did I desire to do the things that you wanted me to do because that's what you wanted me to do? And how did I do it the way you wanted me to do? Turn to Acts 20. This is Paul talking to the elders in Ephesus. Acts 20, verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. When pastors tell me we don't need the Old Testament, they need to be labeled as heretics. Heretics. And then he says, take heed to yourself and to the flock um, which, uh, 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 among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. This is not my church. It's his purchased with his blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourself, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you Warn everyone night and day with tears. That ministers to my heart hugely. In Jude, he says, people have crept in. False people have crept in unnoticed. Paul warned the Ephesians elders what was taking place. This is not new, what we're experiencing. It is getting worse. The truth is getting rare. We are remnant. And we have got to be aware and be encouraged in these last days. For me, if I had a life verse, there's so many of them, how would you pick one? But if I had one, it would be Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. Oh, no, I'm, I mean, I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I'm not, I mean, it, you know, you, sure, you know, you cut me. Do I bleed, right? I mean, come on. But the ultimate truth is, like Hosea, like Daniel, like Joseph, I want to be a man. I want to be like Paul who says, none of these things move me. My life is dead. It's on the altar. And I just want to finish my race with joy. I don't want this stuff to take the joy away from me. I want to do the ministry that I've given, been given to by the Lord to do, and I want to be able to testify to this gospel of grace, and I want to finish strong, and I want to stand before his throne and hear him say, well done. The mission of the church, what it is not, it is not first to entertain. It is not to talk about financial needs. I mean, we can say certain things here and there, 
It is not a social club. It is not a place to, uh, to be a social justice force. It is the body of Christ. We are not left without a vision. The number one mission of the church has been given to us right here. It's found in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore into all the world and make converts to your entertainment, converts to your social cause, con converts to your political cause. No, make disciples of all nations, of all men. And not only did God give us the vision and the mission, he gave us the how. When you turn to Acts 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They broke bread. They ate. They fellowshiped. They had communion. And then who adds to the church? God, when the church is doing what the church is supposed to do. Verse 5. We're going to get there. Therefore, you shall stumble in the day. The prophets also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. Whoa. What? Okay, let's just get that one out of the way right away. That's kind of harsh. He's talking about the mother land of Israel, okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not going to be happy. You know, you know, you're gonna be, because you're not, you're not accepting truth, you're not going to get mercy, you have no knowledge of God, I'm going to destroy your land. I already told you this. He's just saying it in a little different way. It's bad enough to stumble during the night when you can't see, but hor horribly stumble when you're during the day. The stumble during the day. Do we not see the same things taking place today? We do. I just can't stress the point enough. I see so much and hear so much. And that's not, I don't want it to come off as being arrogant or super whatever. It's just all I do is read the word, study it. And then when I hear these things, I've been in enough meetings to know that you've learned your bud words, your, you know, your buzzwords, and your, your, your all about self way to weave these things in. And I mean, I could do that. I'm, I'm, I'm almost smart enough to do that really good. But I won't. I won't, because I don't care if I'm popular in, in this world. I am only care if I'm approved in the next. Verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oh, boy. Anybody who heard my voice, can you imagine I get to heaven? Jeff, you minister to these people for eight years. <clears throat> And four months, and then I took you home. Maybe he's going to take me home tomorrow. And, and then uh, they, they didn't have any knowledge. And they were destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Do you know what I would feel like? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. You ministers have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of God. I also will forget your children, meaning that you're not going to have any heritage. They're not going to come up behind you. The more they increase, the more they have sinned against me. I will charge their glory, uh, uh, change their glory into shame. Whoa. Harsh words, huh? Harsh words. Verse 8. They eat up the sin of my people. You know what that means? They actually secretly take pleasure in the sins of the people that they're supposed to be confronting and telling them not to do. You remember when Ezekiel was, had that vision and he got to see the inside of the priest's life and they were looking at all this porn, 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 pornographic, vile stuff? That was the heart of the pastors. They eat up the sin of my people. They're just like, give me more, give me more. They're like vicariously living through these people who are sinning, thinking, oh, this is so exciting. This is. May God keep our hearts pure, amen? May he rip apart anything that keeps me from him. Remember when I mentioned a few weeks ago that when I first got saved and I was struggling with certain sins, I said, Lord, make me throw up with those sins, right? Just, I don't want to sin. I don't want to do it. I want to honor you. And throwing up, by the way, is one of the worst things in the world to do for me. Maybe some of you guys have no big deal with it, but man, you got, we got that stomach flu and we like just couldn't move for like seven hours. We were like just, oh, it's just so miserable. Give me the bronchial passage problem any day of the week. Last part of verse eight, they set their hearts on their iniquity. <laughs> wow. 
I'm going to reject them. You see, the buck stops with the pastors, the church. I would not want to be some of these pastors when they stand before the judgment seat of God. I, I just honestly would not. I'm worried about myself, but I have not tried to cover up or hold back anything that God has to say. Verse 9, and it shall be like people, like priests. Basically, everyone is just going to follow right along. So I will punish them in their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but have not enough. They shall commit harlotry, they, they shall commit harlotry but not increase because they have ceased to obey the Lord. So you're just going to always be malnutrition, so to speak. You're going to have food to eat, but it's never going to be enough because you've done all these horrible things. But when we follow the Lord, he just lavishes his blessings. I mean, listen, I'm not bragging. I'm giving praise to the Lord of God, the Lord of hosts, the God of gods, the King of kings, okay? My wife and I have sold out for Christ, 1995. Everything in our life has been that way. And I have never lacked for anything I truly needed. I'm boasting not in me, but in the king of kings. Never. And I stood out in front of that house we lived in the other day, and I said, Lord, you are hilarious. Not only have I provided, you provided for the true needs I have, you've given me a greed. (laughs) You've given me a mansion, a palace to live in. But when you're living in sin and you're living on the other edge, you're always searching and never having enough. You're never full. Verse 11, harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. Nothing has changed. Women and wine. Women and wine. My people ask counsel for their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For their spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray And they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifice on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terabiths because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit harlot adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit adultery nor your brides, um, brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with burnt harlots. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. What a mess this culture is in, isn't it? Verse 15, Though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Beth Haven, nor swear an oath, saying, As the Lord lives. Israel is playing the harlot. God is saying, the northern kingdom is playing the harlot. Judah, pay attention. Don't go there. Don't go there. Judah, don't go to Vegas. Don't go there. Don't go where that's all being celebrated. And then when he says, nor go up to Beth Haven, you know what he's doing there? There is no Beth Haven. He's actually changing the name of Baal, uh, Bethel, which is house of... Um, Hold on, I'll get it. House of God. Did you say, somebody said, yeah, good job. House of God. Actually, Beth Haven means house of deceit. So here he is, he's changing the word. There is no Beth Haven. He's actually changing the name of Bethel, which is house of God, to Beth Haven, Bethel, with house of God, to Beth Haven, which means house of deceit. Don't go there. It's so important for us to stay away from things that can cause us to be pulled into this abyss that Israel is playing with. And Judah, here's your warning. Don't go participate in those things. Years ago, I mean, I'm telling you, I've been going through this a long time. I had a guy say, what's wrong with going to a strip club to do witnessing? What's wrong? Come on, are you kidding me? Drive by and pray. I, mean, I didn't even know one was on 50 forever. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, this is right here in our, in our very midst. I'm a bit naive. Um, <laughs> my mom used to live in a bad part of Sacramento. And one day I was watching the news and I said, oh, all those people are prostitutes? <laughs> oh man, thank you Lord for this innocent heart <clears throat> and blind eyes. Um, 
you know, I mean, they need to be, they need to hear the word of God. I got it. Well, Jesus sat down with sinners, but not where they were sinning. Uh, verse 16, for Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. <laughs> and now the Lord will not let them forge like a lamb in open country. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let them alone. Oh boy. You hear that? That's Romans 1. Let them alone. Go. You want to go that way? Go that way. Worst thing God can do to you. The most important thing that you can receive from God is horrible conviction, losing a night's sleep if you're trying to sin. That's the best place to be until you repent. But when God says, "Uh uh-uh, leave them alone, oh boy, leave them alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. Gosh, is it just not describing America 2023? The rind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this, O priest. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of king. For, <clears throat> for yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mitzbah and a net uh, spread on Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter. Though I rebuke them all, I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. (laughs) The leaders didn't lead in a godly way. The pastors didn't lead the way they're supposed to lead. They listen to the people, but God is going to hold the pastors responsible at a higher level than he's going to hold the people. And the people just continue to run after their own slaughter. Verse 4, they do not direct their deeds towards turning uh, turning to their God, for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst, and they do not know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity, Judah also stumbles with them. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. Now a new moon shall devour them, and their heritage blow the ram's horn at Gibeah and the trumpet at Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Haven. Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. I make known this for sure. They were stuck in their pride. But God is calling them to repentance, calling them to come back to him. God has withdrawn himself. There comes a point when he does. Verse 10, the priest, the princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. Well, that's huge to me. I think landmarks are being removed all over the place. And I will pour out my wrath on them like water. See, I had a vision when we were praying with the men today that God was pouring out his wrath like us like water out of a bucket on our hearts and on our souls. But here he's pouring out wrath like that. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walks by human precepts. Therefore, I will be like Ephraim, like a moth, and to the house of Judah like rottenness. When Ephraim saw his wickedness and Judah saw his wounds, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the king, uh, Jerob. Yet he cannot cure you nor heal you of your wounds. Verse 14. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they shall seek my face and their affliction. They will earnestly seek me.
And when we get into chapter 6, we're going to see a call to repentance. If we left it like this, it would be depressing, wouldn't it? (laughs) But here's the thing. Remember what I told you early on in the introduction? This is really truly all about God's love and his grace on his people Israel. And he has that same love and that same grace for America circa 2023. But the condition of Israel was rotten. The condition of America is rotten. There are some people being given over but you and I are still standing here with the message of calling to repent. America, repent and come and receive Christ as Savior. That's the message that God wants us to deliver. We need to, as the remnant, to continue to stand strong in Jesus because we are in tough days and we have tougher days ahead, I think. And we can't be moved. We can't go to the right or to the left. We can't turn around. We put our hands to the plow. We go forward and we just let ever what's going to happen happen, and we just do what Jesus asked us to do. And I'm okay. I really am better than okay. Okay, there's a part of me when I look out at the condition of our world that breaks my heart, right? I can hardly watch the news right now because it breaks my heart. Five kids plowed over by a van in Pollock Pines. I mean, how do you watch that stuff? I mean, it just breaks your heart. I hope none of them die. I hope they all live, and they're all going to be fine. I hope the young man who did it, I guess he was 21 years old. I hope he was okay. I hope he's going to, I mean, he's emotionally scarred for the rest of his life at 21. Whether there was anything of neglect on his part, I don't know. I don't, we don't know. But how do you turn on the news and watch? You turn on the news and you see this, the Dodgers doing this and they're, with their stadium and you're going, oh my gosh. You go, I, guess, I guess there was a, 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 somebody at Disneyland yesterday, a transgender person welcoming people into one of the parks that I don't remember which park it was, Everland or Neverland or whatever or whatever. I don't, you know, forgive me, I don't remember what, what it was. And, and you got parents going, "Come and look at this weird guy." I'm sorry, the man needs Jesus. But to me, I just find it really kind of well. I don't need to go there. It's hard, but we got to remember he needs Jesus. We got to remember that we need to share the truth and love. And even though the world doesn't want to hear, stand fast. The hardest thing for me, though, out of all the things I've mentioned is the fact that the church no longer wants to stand on the word of God. Quite frankly, that's the part that breaks my heart the most. But I'm only accountable for me and to warn those who are around. Don't be taken in by this slick stuff. I know you guys won't. I'm speaking to the special forces here, but don't be taken in by it. Don't be taken in by it. If you can teach a 42-minute message and not mention sin when you're talking about the gospel, there is a problem. Father, help us. Help us to stand strong in you. Help us to not waver. You're our anchor. You're our, you're the, you are the shelter, Lord. You're the strong tower that we run into. And Lord, we know that ultimately you're going to finish your call on Israel's life in the period known as Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation period. You have not forsaken your people. You love them, and you love us, and you still love this world. And Lord, even though this world doesn't love your message, Lord, give us the boldness and the strength to stand strong. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
It'll get us through these days. Indubitably. Indubitably. <laughs> Amen. Hey, uh, you know, just, uh, I, I'm going to say this so you guys know, but also it's, I'm going to sneak this on YouTube through my channel and then upload it to the website. See, there's more than one way. Is it okay to say there's more than one way to skin a cat? All right. I mean, am I going to have the animal people after me now? I mean, I'm in trouble, right? I just seem to open my mouth and I get in trouble. Trouble comes in. But anyways, I'm going to get it up there and then, and then, you know, with some help from people like Lisa in the weeks to come and Mike and maybe Dad, Drew and whatever, we'll find another streaming platform and, and um, do whatever we need to do. But um, that's the goal. And uh, remember not to hate the world because they need Jesus. All right. God bless you guys. And say hi to my friend Linda. Welcome. We're glad you're here. This is everybody. Well, this isn't everybody. It's almost everybody, but it's not quite everybody. She's from uh, now, you were in Auburn. Yes. And then you moved to? California for 10 years. Okay, where again? I say California. Yeah, South Dakota, wasn't it? I was from Illinois. Oh, Illinois. Okay. And so you moved out here? Yes. Yeah. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Yeah. You'll fit right in. 